Puddle comes real handy is you can actually then see the BBs then hitting the white styrofoam. Watch, I'll turn it on again. And they're hitting hard this white styrofoam. And it's that force of impact of those BBs that is creating the, the pressure. In other words, pressure, let me just define pressure, pressure is force per area. Uh, it's not the total force, in fact if I rearrange this equation, if you take pressure and you multiply it by the area, you get force. And so I want to emphasize that but as these BBs come along, I just want you at first here to conceptually know where does this pressure come from and it's the actual impact of these BBs. Uh, I like to use the, the phrase that these BBs or these molecules are really, really small, but they are going really, really fast and there's lots of them. And so I call them the mighty midgets. Because, as you will soon see, they can be really powerful. You don't think much about them, and I think mostly because you can't see them. You I don't see the molecules in the air. And I think also because you know, well, they're small, but there's lots of them, and they're going pretty fast. And so all of that I want to talk here in more uh, uh, detail. But I think maybe the, the best thing to do is just to kind of illustrate how much force uh, we could actually get and and what this uh, pressure is and I'll start with just saying then where the pressure comes from and what are the units. I'll, I'll hold off for a second on the units but I think you saw A where it comes from. Let me grab my my pointer over here and show you an added piece of this. You know if I turn this on and they're hitting them what if I did this? What if I push down on the white styrofoam. And of course to do that I've got to push down so I've got to do a force. But you can see it was in equilibrium so that would tell me the net force was zero and so as I push down and of course also gravity is pushing down. So between me and the weight of the styrofoam we're pushing down. It's those BBs then are pushing back up. And they're pushing up with a force that is equal to what I'm pushing down plus the weight of them. You see when I wasn't pushing down they're pushing up with a force that is equal to the weight of the styrofoam. But when I push down on them now they're pushing back with a force of the weight of the styrofoam and my hand. And, and so the pressure has changed. The pressure has gone up when I, when I push down on here. But again, conceptually, I just want you to see where are we getting that pressure. And we're getting the pressure from those, those BBs. Those BBs are, are, are moving around here. And so as they make an impact, they are giving me a force per unit area. So to get the total force, I would multiply by the area of that white styrofoam. But whatever its force is, uh, I'll just make up a number. Uh, let's just say it's 30 newtons. And I don't know what the area of this uh, styrofoam is, but why don't I say, oh, uh, pi r squared is the area of a circle. It's about two centimeters. So I'll square that. That's about four. Pi is roughly a three. So roughly, it's probably 12 square centimeters. So if I uh, grab a, a calculator here, uh, maybe I don't need a calculator. It goes into what, 24 and then six more, that's half. So it would be two and a half newtons per centimeter squared. But let me pause right there and this would be then the, the force. How much force do I get in one square centimeter is what this is, is saying here. Um, you can imagine all of our other units were done in distances of meters not centimeters so let me continue on. Let me take you back to chapter one and remind you it's not cm for centimeters, it's c for centa 
in m for meters. And so this really means centa squared. I'll, I'll put it on the board here again. Remember your math class, if you had x, y squared, you would have done x squared and then y squared once you eliminated the parentheses. And so that's what I'm, I'm doing right here. And in addition to that, I'll replace the word centa with what it means, 10 to the minus 2. And so this becomes, I'll put it down here, 2.5 newtons. And then this becomes 10 to the minus 4. And maybe again, I should remind you of your algebra class. If you had seen x squared raised to a power of 3, you would have multiplied the exponents together. And sure enough, that's what I'm doing. So 2 times 2 is, is 4. And I would get, and so this would be 2.5. And if I move this upstairs, it becomes 10 to the plus 4. And then newtons per square meter. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, write this out. This would be, move it four places, 25,000 newtons per square meter. And then finally what I'm trying to get at is we are then, in honor of Pascal, going to refer to our units of pressure as Pascal. Okay, and so a Pascal, as I said, is a unit of pressure. And it's in honor of Pascal and the work that, that uh, he did for uh, science and, and, and pressure. And remember then, it's the force per one square meter. In fact, it reminds me of a silly joke if we got time for a, for a, for a, for a silly joke. Uh, Einstein, Newton, and Pascal are playing hide and go seek. And uh, if you know the game hide and go seek, one person is it and they count and keep their eyes closed while the other two go hide and uh, the person goes looks for them. So Einstein is it. So Einstein leans up against a tree and covers his eyes and starts counting. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Okay. And so Pascal and Newton look at each other and say, okay, let's go hide. And so Pascal goes running off and hides in a bush. And Newton, being Newton and being very smart and clever, takes about a step back from Einstein, stands in the dirt, draws a box around him, and stays there. Well, Einstein gets done counting, turns around, and he, he sees Newton right there. Tags him, says, ah, now you're it, Newton. I found you. And Newton says, nah. -uh. You found Newton in a square meter. So you found Pascal. Pascal is it, not Newton. All right, well, I, I told you it was a silly joke. But it does hopefully remind you that a Pascal is a unit called a Newton meter. And that might be a little new for you. I, I think most of you have probably heard of PSI. Uh, that's not part of the metric system, right? That's part of the empirical units, kind of the uh, English unit system. And of course, PSI stands for pounds, so there's your force, per square inch, and there's your area. So it's the same idea, it's just a different set of, of, of units. And so that's the unit system in the uh, empirical unit system. So again, we are going to use uh, Pascal. It also turns out that a Pascal is not a very big pressure, so a lot of our gauges that we use, and you'll, you'll see that today in the lab, we'll use kilopascals. So we'll use the prefix kila to make a thousand uh, pascals. All right. So I just want to keep that uh, important. In fact, why don't I use this as a moment to talk about, you know, a, a good example of a calculation. And I'll use the PSI only because I'm thinking of my car for a moment. The car tires uh, on my car are rated to inflate, you know, uh, to 35 PSI. So 35 pounds per, per square inch. And so that's the, the, the pressure. Now, be careful with this because when I get on my bike, my road bike, 
they've got these little narrow tires and on those little narrow tires it says fill it up to a hundred PSI and when I read that at first it's kind of confusing I'm thinking okay now the car which weighs more than my bike says the tires only need 35 PSI but my bike needs 100 PSI isn't that more I don't get that I know my bike does not weigh more than my car I don't understand why the pressure is so much higher and be careful pressure is not force right pressure is the force per unit area and I say that because if I come over here and I draw kind of the tire on a car uh, versus the tire on my bike it might look something like this the car tire uh, is got a little bit of a flat spot where it's touching the road uh, then it goes around and it has kind of a, a, a width to it and so for my car tire if you looked closely at it the, the flat part is about five inches and the width of my tire is also about five inches and so there is 25 square inches of tire touching the road and here's always a fun comment to make what is holding up my car and when people say that they go well obviously what's holding up your car in other words it's the tires if you didn't have tires your your car would fall down on the ground your your tires are holding up your car and I'd say well not really I mean it's true the tires on the outside have rubber but what's inside of the tire and that's the air molecules and so I would say and I'll come back over to here what is really holding up my car are these bouncing BBs and so if I turn this on this is kind of the picture this is the car and then this down here is the rubber that then of course touches the road so it's not like it's a solid rubber tire it's not the rubber that is holding up my car in fact I know if I you know get a flat in other words if the air goes out the, the, it sinks all the way down it is the air that is holding up my, my car and so amazingly and that's why I call them the mighty midgets these little tiny molecules are what is holding up the whole weight of my car in fact I can even tell you the weight of my car from this information because if I take that equation over here and let me simplify it a little bit let me take a moment to say let's use the symbol capital P for pressure okay so I will put a capital P here for pressure and of course F for force we've already been using and capital A we haven't seen for quite a while but we saw at the beginning that's the symbol for area and so to get the total force you have to have pressure and area and that's what I'm trying to emphasize that is really the answer to why I pump up my bike tire to a pressure of hundred PSI but my car tires to only 35 PSI because when I look at my car tires I take this pressure of 35 pounds for every square inch but you see I have a lot of square inches that are lifting up the car I have 25 square inches from one tire and then I have four tires whereas my bike looks something like this my bike tire again has a flat spot just like my car tire and then it has a width to it uh, I didn't give myself a good way of drawing the flat spot 
But my road bike, you know, the, the tire itself is maybe an inch wide, but it narrows down and rounds out. And so I would say that if I looked at the rectangle that is actually touching the ground, it's about two inches long and it's about a half an inch wide. And the, the width of it is not even the width of the tire. The tire is already pretty narrow. But even then, because it, it's rounded, when I, when I sit on it, 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 it kind of uh, flattens out a little bit, but it's only about a half an inch. And, and so two times a half is only one square inch. And that's what I'm trying to get at is I need so much more pressure because pressure is not the overall total force. Pressure is just the force per area. And so what I'm going to need is a lot of force in this small area in order to hold up the bike and, and me. In fact, if I go to then calculate what is the total force holding up my bike, it would look something like this. I would take the 100 pounds per square inch. I would then multiply by the one square inch that is now touching the road. And then of course my bike has two tires. So when I do this calculation, I get a two times 100, that's 200 pounds and notice the square inches. Come around. So I would say that those mighty midgets, those atoms that are inside that car tire, are pushing up with a total force of 200. And that makes sense. By the time you weigh me and my bike, we're, we're about 200 pounds. And so in order for me to, you know, my bike to stay up, I need this force of 200 pounds. Anything less than that, we would go down. And I guess anything more than that, we would go up. And so we need a net force of zero. And 200 pounds does that. Whereas my car, well, let's see, uh, 25 times 4 is 100, 100 times 35 is 3,500 pounds. And so, sure enough, there is a lot more force holding up my car. Not more pressure, more force. Did you catch that? And so that was that important distinction. Let me come over here and point it out again. Be really careful here. Pressure, as I was trying to say, is not the total force. It's just how much force you get per unit area. So on a, a bike, bike tire, this illustrates really well that you, right here, may not have much area, but with the high pressure, you can have enough to support 200 pounds. Now, that's not even close to holding up a car. But a car, surprisingly, really doesn't need that much high pressure. It only needs 35 because the area, the four tires plus the wider tire and the longer tire, really account for the extra area. It's why, of course, you can tell when a car tire is low or a bike tire is low because you can imagine if this number goes down, but of course the weight of the car isn't going to change. You still need to hold up the 3,500 pounds of the car. If that number goes down, say to 34 or 33 or 30, then to get this same amount of force, the area has to go up. In order to get more area, the tire kind of sags and the, this rounded part flattens out and then the, you know, the width of the tire flattens out and you get this little bulge on the sidewall and you can now tell, hey, 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 this, this tire is, is, is low. Actually, if you could even see it bulging out, it's probably been very low uh, because just a little low is, you know, bad enough in terms of gas mileage um, and wear but you won't notice it. So, you know, you're at 33, you won't even notice it, but I would encourage you, check your car tires. They're, they're, they're worth checking once a month and just making sure they're at the correct uh, value. And so just, you know, open the driver's door and it'll be posted right on the inside. What, what is my pressure supposed to be? And a lot of them are around 35 PSI. And so put that in there and then you, you know, uh, we'll get better wear on your tires, better gas mileage, better traction in case there's an, you know, an emergency, you need to stop quick and you'll be, you'll be much happier with the right uh, pressure. 
All right, but I digress from really the, the, the point here, and that is to try to introduce you to pressure and the units. And I know I got sidetracked with PSI here because that was a little more common, but I thought that would give you a chance to really get a feel for the difference between pressure and force. Force is, you know, of course, the, what you might call the accumulation of value. It's why, believe it or not, don't, don't necessarily try this, but it's really not that big of a deal to have your foot run over <laughs> By a, by a car. In fact, surprisingly, it happened to me <laughs> recently. A friend stopped by and rolled down the window, and I, I walked up and I was chatting. And then they, you know, were kind of in a hurry and they started moving uh, forward. And I said, All right, well, see you later. And, you know, they were just kind of moving forward. We were still kind of talking, and the back tire just went right over the top of my foot. I was like, Whoa. <laughs> uh, but again, it's not that much. It's nothing like my foot gets run over by my bike. You know, when a friend runs over my foot on the bike, it, it hurts. There's just a, a, a lot, a lot of, of, of pressure. So it's not so much the force, but it's uh, the area. In fact, you could describe a nail like that. Most people, when they hammer a nail, they use the pointy side. <laughs> they don't put the head down and hammer on the pointy side. They put the pointy side into the wood and hammer on the head. Uh, it's the same force, but a different pressure, a very different pressure, because that same force on the sharp tip of a nail is a lot of pressure, and it goes into the wood. That same force on the head of a nail isn't much pressure, and it doesn't go into it. So, surprisingly. Uh, another surprising one is just getting stepped on by an elephant. An elephant, you think, oh my gosh! But it, really it's not. The pressure on an elephant's foot is usually less than the pressure on a human foot. Or you really want a lot of pressure, put the weight of somebody on a, on a narrow area like a high hill. The pressure is huge. In fact, in the 50s and 60s, when uh, spiked high heels were the, the style, um, it, it was actually required for uh, women going into these fancy banks that had marble flooring in New York City to remove their shoes because the pressure was so high, it would actually put holes in marble. Uh, marble, of course, is a rock, but it's not that hard of a rock, but it's still a rock, and, and, and it would go right into the, into the rock. And so it's, a, it's amazing how pri high the pressure can actually get, even though it, the total force is not much. The, the, these weren't heavy women, you know. The, 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 these were just on high hills. And so it's an interesting uh, Factor, and that's what I'm trying to point out this important mathematical factor between pressure, area, and uh, force. Well, hopefully, I, I spent enough time on that, but I've got some neat ones to, to kind of show you. Um, I don't know if you are uh, familiar with the air pressure, but let me just tell you that the molecules in this room right here and the molecules in front of you are bouncing around, and so just like this contraption, they're bouncing around. They're bouncing around in this room, and they're, they're, they're hitting me right now. They're, they're hitting this flask. They're hitting this uh, balloon. And so what we refer to then as the atmospheric pressure, the air pressure, in fact, sometimes we even call it one atmosphere, and that's fine. It is sometimes nice to label pressure in relationship to the atmosphere. But what... I want you to know, and what you'll need for your homework and your calculation, is that that's about 100, 101,300 uh, pascals. And if you want a number to work with, that's about 14.7 PSI also. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, I bring that up then is because what would happen if I wanted to blow up a balloon? And so if I come over here and I say, okay, I'm going to blow up a, a balloon. This looks like a good one. And so I grab this green balloon and I blow it up. And you might think, oh, it's hard to blow up because you have to overcome the elastic of this balloon. And I'd say that's not quite the whole story, although it's true that the elastic of this balloon, the latex of this balloon, is got to be overcome by my lungs to blow it up. There's also something else I have to overcome. 
And since I don't see it, it's easy to forget about it, and it's these air molecules. And so these air molecules are pushing. That's why when I let go of this right here, and I better hold it, right, the air comes shooting out. And again, I'm sure what's going through your mind first is, well, the air goes shooting out because, again, the latex in the balloon is squeezing it. And although that's true, that's not the full story. What's also happening, and even more than the latex of the balloon pushing on it, is the molecules in the room are squeezing on the balloon. They're doing this. They're, they're like just squeezing it to, to force it out. Mm. And you see that with a couple of experiments here. Oh, watch this. This is fun to see here. I put a balloon in a flask, and if you look, this flask does have a hole in it. So could I blow this balloon up? Sure, I'll just blow it up. <laughs> and if I take my mouth away, it comes shooting out because I have this opening here. But this is surprising. What if I blow it up and put a cork in it so it can't get back in? You will see it stays inflated. And if I pull it out, now the air can squeeze it and push it out. In fact, if I, if I start with the cork in here and try to blow it up, <laughs> I can't. And the reason, and we often forget about these mighty midgets because they're hard to see, but inside of this flask there is a bunch of molecules. And they got to be pushed out of the way and they're trapped, they can't, so they push back and the, and the more I, I push on them, they push back even more and more as they get trapped into a little tighter spot. So that's why opening it up works great. Then they'll just go racing out the end. And then if I take my mouth away, they go shooting back here. But putting it, the container in here, it gets stuck that way. And so again, these mighty midgets are worth seen and, and uh, mentioning it. In fact, really the same thing can be done right here with, uh, oh this looks like a better bottle. And so if you look here, I would say, okay look, nothing in the bottle, right? No, not true. <laughs> there is something in the bottle. What's in the bottle? Air molecules. And so these air molecules are in here. And so I would say right now, that I have air molecules in the bottle, but I also have air molecules outside the bottle. And the ones on the inside are pushing outward, and the ones on the outside are, are pushing in, and fortunately those are balanced. That's why I have the opening. If one was bigger than the other, they would flow in and out. But if I do this, if I take this bottle, and I hook it into what we call a vacuum, and what a vacuum is, is a little machine that takes away the molecules. So in this case, I'm going to take them away from the inside of this bottle. And I want you to see something that I, I think is quite surprising. It gets smashed. But more importantly is why did it get smashed? And I would say it got smashed because the air molecules on the outside the, the vacuum didn't smash it or pull it in. The vacuum just took away the molecules on the inside that were keeping the ones from the outside from smashing it in. And so it smashed it. Can I get it back full? Sure, use the molecules again. I can then put the molecules back in and they will do the pushing for me. And so again, as you are seeing here in this ideal gas law, these, these mighty midgets here are, are quite uh, fascinating. Well, I bet I'll show you a couple more, but then we better move on here with time, otherwise we're never going to finish up this chapter. It's got really some, some neat stuff in here. Look, look at this one. This, this is a nice little chamber that I can also hook the vacuum to, so I'll hook it up. But you might notice here that I have a, a balloon partially filled. It would be like taking this green one here and just putting a little bit of air in it. And you'd say, okay, well, it's only a little tiny balloon because it's only pushing out a little bit. Sure, because you only put a few molecules in there. Sure. 
But I'll say it again, it's easy to overlook what is determining the size of this balloon is a balance between the ones on the inside, the mighty midgets on the inside pushing out, and what's pushing in. And what's pushing in are two things. Yes, the elastic of the balloon, the latex of the balloon, but that's only a small piece of it. The most important part pushing on this balloon is actually the molecules on the outside, the stuff that we forget about because it's all around us all the time and we can't see it, they're invisible. But if you were to take them away from the outside, I would say then the ones on the inside would really show you their strength of pushing out. It's not just the latex in this balloon. And so if I could take away these molecules on the outside, you would see this balloon get bigger and bigger. And so I can do that in this little chamber. In this little chamber hooked to this vacuum, I can take away the molecules on the outside. I have put just a few on the inside. And right now the, the, the balloon size is determined by a balance between the ones on the inside pushing out and then what's pushing in is two things, the ones on the outside and the latex of the balloon. I am going to remove the ones on the outside. And you will hopefully see something quite fascinating. And so I will turn on this pump. And as this pump takes more and more and more out, you will see that the ones on the inside are able to show really their true strength. And eventually, of course, they will be balanced by the latex of the balloon. And so now, the ones on the inside pushing out are balanced by pushing in, where the only thing pushing in is the latex of the, of the balloon, not the air on the outside. And I think that's as far as we go. I'm looking at the pump and the pump says, okay, we've removed all the molecules from the inside. And so this is that balance point. It's also fun to see, watch what happens when I let the molecules back in. And so I will pull this off and let the air molecules from the room back in and you'll see them squeeze. And so again, this again, is why it's part of the structure of the uh, of matter is to point out that these molecules and I erased it. I used to say up here this ideal gas law. This ideal gas law is a very very powerful tool. Watch. I'll, I'll show you a couple more real quick and then we better uh, move on. I like this one. This one's a lot like this one where I took the molecules out of the inside except here's the difference. This one is made out of thick steel. So if I take two hemispheres and put them together, and I want to point out they don't stick, okay? But they do have a rubber piece between them. And I would say, well, nothing's pushing them together, right? Nothing's on the inside, right? No, 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 not true at all. These mighty midgets are on the outside hitting and pushing in. But the mighty midgets on the inside are hitting out and they balance each other and so we often forget about them because they balance each other and we just say, oh yeah, they don't, they don't really stay to, together here. There's nothing pushing them in. There's nothing pushing them out. And I would say that's, that's not true. There is an equal pushing in as pushing out. And you see that best when I then hook up the vacuum to it and remove the molecules on the inside. Because as you can now see, they are stuck together. There is something holding them together. And it's not glue. It's the mighty midgets out here in the room. The mighty midgets out here in the room are hitting here. Hitting hard. They're hitting on this side too. And they're holding it together. In fact, if I go to do a calculation, you're going to see that this calculation is a lot higher than you might have thought. Uh, that's why, again, I keep calling them the mighty midgets. They're invisible and they're small, but there's lots of them going very fast. And they can actually make a huge amount of force. In fact, if I turn this valve off, or close it, I should say, and remove the vacuum pump, there's still 
stuck together because I have the molecule still on the outside pushing in. And if I do a, a quick calculation here and say, okay, how much is that? I might say, okay, the force is pressure times area. And so if I look at just pushing in, and so I'll just take one side here, and so the molecules on this side are, are, are pushing in, uh, I would say that that force is 14.7 pounds for every square inch. Of course, now you might say, well, how many square inches do you have? And so you can see here, I kind of have a cross section of a circle. And so if you imagine a, a circle pushing in here, um, it looks like the circle has a radius of maybe about two inches. And so if I go pi times two inches squared, I will get the amount of force pushing in on that, which means for me to open it, I've got to push at a force greater than that. And this is a big number, 14.7 times pi times two squared is about 185 pounds. And so now maybe you're beginning to see why I call these the mighty midgets. You're, you're beginning to see that this is, this, this is actually a lot of force. And, and, and there's no way I can pull it apart. I need 185 newtons, uh, uh, sorry, pounds to pull this apart. Now, one way of getting it besides me pulling it, which I can't get enough to pull it apart, but I can let molecules in. So I'll open the valve, let them in. <laughs> and they do all the pushing for me. I don't even need anyone. They, they will give me the 185 that I, that, that I need. And they, they come apart here. And so they don't collapse like this soft plastic did when I took the molecules out. They stay solid because of the steel, but they're held together by them. Well, one more just because it's kind of fun here. I like this little rubber square because, again, it shows the pressure and the molecules and this ideal gas law I'm trying to convey to you without really, uh, you know, um, uh, which is so easy to forget about in these room molecules because